Well, good afternoon, Facebook, and happy Monday to all of you. Welcome to another episode of You've Got the Power. I'm your host, Dr. Jason Deitch. Of course, we are here with Chief Medical Officer at the Centeno Schultz Clinic, where we are broadcasting live from today. Dr. Chris Centeno, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Jason. Got a great topic today, stem cells and supplements, supplements and stem cells, what you need to know how they really are related, how they are connected, what are the most important supplements you really need to know about in order to be able to really support your procedure, support your care, support your recovery, uh, and do everything possible to really help yourself. That is the spirit of You've Got the Power. If you've got questions, now is the time to ask the source, really. Uh, for those of you that are new to this program, Dr. Chris Centeno is the inventor uh, of many of the stem cell procedures that have now become, uh, you know, understood as the standard of care uh, within regenerative orthopedics. Dr. Centeno, let's get right into it. What is it that people need to know about supplements and stem cells? Yeah, so there's a couple of big topics to think about there when, when trying to put supplements into categories and how they might affect stem cells. The first and biggest one for every American is inflammation. You know, many uh, Americans, as we get older, carry around a lot of chronic inflammation. Obviously, that can lead to bad things like heart disease, uh, dementia. But uh, in addition, it can hurt how your stem cells work. So it's controlling that chronic inflammation. So what are some things you can do there? Obviously, there are things like fasting, uh, but it, on the supplement side, you know, high dose fish oil, um, curcumin, uh, those are all supplements that can help to reduce that chronic inflammation. And then when we started doing our own research, lab research, to try to create a, a stem cell support formula, we looked at things like proliferation. Uh, were certain supplements able to help stem cells in culture grow better? Uh, we looked at uh, surviving an inflammatory challenge. So, uh, for example, if someone's body did have inflammation, um, and how would that affect the stem cells? And then could certain supplements rescue the stem cells and get them through the inflammation better uh, than other supplements? Uh, so, as we looked at all of that, it took us about a year, we put together a stem cell support formula with various ingredients that perform the best in those uh, lab trials that we did. And so that's another thing in looking for stem cell supplements is, is trying to see if there's some clinical data. And there's really no clinical data for any stem cell supplement on the market right now. Uh, is there some lab data that's been done on those stem cell ingredients that are in that? Um, or is it just some guy looking at some research who says, this looks pretty good, I'll throw this in there, I'll throw that in there. Um, so those are all things to consider when looking at uh, what goes into uh, supplements you might wanna take for uh, stem cell health and to try to help your stem cell procedure. Let, let's talk about the stem cell formula that uh, you and your team have formulated. Let's break down um, what research there is to support those ingredients so people at least have an understanding. Uh, and then as you're doing that, maybe help us understand the difference between, you know, going to a local big box and saying, oh, you know, uh, curcumin is one of those ingredients. I could get it here at, you know, on Amazon or at Costco or fill in the blank at some large retailer. Uh, what is the difference, in your opinion, between those, you know, big box supplements and the ingredients you use in your Regenex formulas? Yeah, so the first thing, we'll work, work backwards on that one. Um, I, I've logged on this a number of years ago. You may or may not have seen it. There was a big expose on uh, Costco, um, Walgreens, um, a lot of the places we might go to get the cheapest available supplements. And regrettably, many of them were sawdust, uh, meaning many of them uh, did not have the ingredients stated on the bottle. Uh, I, I don't really fault the, the companies for that. I think they were trying to get the cheapest possible one. And some factory in China raised its hand and said, I've got one cheaper. And obviously there were some problems on the manufacturing manufacturer side. But I think it's one of the reasons why I don't buy cheap supplements anymore since that came out. Um, I'm always concerned that someone who's looking for the absolute lowest 
wholesale price so they can give you the lowest retail price on that supplement is probably getting duped just like those major chains were getting duped. Um, so if I'm looking for supplements, you know, I go from mid mid to more expensive just because uh, I try to stick with brands. I know as far as our supplement, we actually did about a year of actual lab research with bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells with those supplements. We looked at uh, things like uh, proliferation, meaning could the supplements help cells grow? Uh, cartilage production, could the supplements help uh, stem cells produce cartilage? The ability to survive an inflammatory challenge. And then sourced our ingredients uh, with, with folks making stuff that we could uh, validate in the lab. So uh, very, very different than sort of the lowest price. Having said that, if you look at that stem cell support formula, and I've done this a couple of times on Amazon, it's kind of an eight and one. So if you go on Amazon and even try to buy the cheapest stuff out there uh, for all eight of those supplements, it's generally as much or more than uh, the stem cell support formula. So uh, it's actually not a high price supplement if you look at what's in it and trying to just go on Amazon and find the cheapest or uh, ones out there. Can't, can't really do it uh, very easily. I've tried can't compare. Uh, there's a whole bunch of questions I want to ask you. If you're watching and you've got questions, now's the time you can ask them. Um, what I want to know is, is a variety of things. For example, one of them is uh, how important is your actual, you know, eating, your diet, your nutrition? You know, obviously we look for supplements to supplement what we should naturally be eating. I know that Dr. John Pitts at the Centeno Schultz uh, wrote the book Nutrition 2.0. Uh, the, the, help us understand, you can't eat anything you want and expect supplements to, you know, overcome uh, a terrible diet that is counterproductive, increasing inflammation while trying. Help us understand the value and importance of both of those things. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what, what Dr. Pitts talks about and what we often talk about, and that's a great book that you should get and read, because it's first moving away from, obviously, things that are that are grown the wrong way um, with pesticides and uh, all the other chemicals that are used when things are grown to organic. Um, that's the first choice. Then the second choice would be staying away from inflammatory artificial oils uh, and using natural uh, plant-based oils uh, that are anti-inflammatory and that's talked about in the book. Uh, then another component of that is a low glycemic uh, diet. So a diet that doesn't mess with your blood sugar um, and, uh, and that's really staying away from, you know, sugar and flour and all that high carby sweet stuff. Uh, and then, uh, obviously, uh, if you really want to help your stem cells, there's a, a concept that's reasonably well vetted at this point in the research literature of doing some intermittent fasting. Um, so, you know, just doing a fasting mimicking diet, you don't have to stop eating but it's, it's just reducing your calories uh, in that sub thousand calorie for the day range, uh, which kind of activates the similar benefits of actually not eating anything during the day. Um, so those are all things to consider in your diet, but you're right. If you're, if you're, you know, going to uh, uh, McDonald's and, you know, buying cheeseburgers uh, and you're living off of that stuff or eating a lot of sugary things or, you're eating um, stuff that's you know grown in a field full of Roundup. Uh, all of those things are not good for what it is we're talking about here. Exactly. All right, I've got more questions. I'm going to ask you in just a moment about what conditions people are experiencing that they should be taking these supplements for, and the benefits of taking them pre-procedure and post-procedure. But before you go there, Rachel, our friend Rachel Riggs has a question. Let's get to hers first. Hi, Rachel. Uh, she says, I'm allergic to curcumin, which precludes me from taking your supplements. Which single, quote, well-sourced supplements should I take? Yeah, then I think what you should do is, is to part it out. Um, that's what I've told patients to do. So uh, glucosamine uh, uh, chondroitin would be a good one to take. Um, you can add to that uh, fish oil to try to get so high dose uh, EPA uh, concentrated fish oil, uh, 
to try to get the anti-inflammatory effect of the curcumin, because that's really why the curcumin uh, is in there. Uh, and then you can look at other things like bitter melon, uh, which is a, a part of our supplement, um, tart cherry, uh, those sorts of things. But I think if you had to just take two, it would be glucosam glucosamine, chondroitin, uh, and high-dose fish oil, I think would be a very nice complement uh, if you couldn't take that stem cell support formula. Rachel's follow-up question is, uh, what does glucosamine do exactly? Yeah, so glucosamine and chondroitin are two of the better studied supplements that are out there. Um, they're both anti-inflammatory, so uh, act as, as cartilage components. So there's some interesting research, for instance, on both showing that they're, they work similarly in, in punch to prescription non anti-inflammatories like Celebrex uh, or Motrin, uh, which is an over-the-counter uh, anti-inflammatory. So I think what we're, what we're seeing with uh, those supplements is that they're both helping with cartilage protection in all likelihood based on the existing high-level research, as well as with controlling inflammation. And they're doing the, the inflammation control generally through different pathways than natural anti-inflammatory drugs work because the one, the COX pathway that natural anti-inflammatories works through is really not uh, a healthy one to inhibit. There you go. Uh, Rachel follows up with, thanks for the info. You're welcome, Rachel. Thanks for watching. We always appreciate your questions and appreciate you. So thank you. Uh, let's get into uh, what conditions might people be experiencing that uh, would you recommend they try the Regenex stem cell formulation perhaps prior to a procedure? Is that a recommended uh, idea? Yeah, I mean, it's a very good anti-inflammatory supplement. And I've had patients who um, start taking it before a procedure, then go through the procedure, and you know, then they don't get off of it because they're like, this works well for me. Um, just from an inflammatory standpoint. So yes, you can certainly take it before procedure or after, or if you're not doing a procedure at all. Um, and as far as taking it um, with uh, uh, a procedure, you'd want to start it a good uh, couple months before the procedure, stay on it a couple months after a procedure if you're just focusing on the procedure itself. And you, uh, you, you touched on my next question, which is, uh, you know, help us understand, you know, as we age, we have more inflammation, we, <laughs> we're older, we get more active, we do more things, more chemicals, more activity, it just doesn't work the way it used to. Um, so some people live with a chronic inflammation. Is this the kind of supplement that you could sort of take month after month after month to proactively manage, you know, the inflammation and the impact of that inflammation on, you know, future health conditions? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you certainly can do that. Uh, it's got all the right ingredients for that. Uh, glucosamine, chondroitin, curcumin, uh, black pepper, or bioparine, which is an extract of uh, black pepper that helps with curcumin absorption. Uh, so I, I take many of those components on a daily basis just for uh, to suppress that low level of chronic inflammation. That does two things. One, it messes with your heart and neurologic system. The other that low level thing that that low level chronic inflammation does is it it makes you hurt more um, and generally more, more at the spots where you've got little issues. So if you can suppress that and control that, I think you can function better as well. Um, and you know, also listen to your body. So if things poke through, control uh, supplement control of low level low level inflammation, you know they've got to be dealt with. If things never really poke through that, then they generally don't need to be dealt with because we're not talking about an unhealthy type of inflammation uh, suppression like you see with Motrin. We're talking about a healthier type. As an example, fish oil has resolvins in it. Uh, what are those? Those are chemicals to help to resolve inflammation rather than just suppress inflammation. So different concepts than you have with, uh, for instance, taking Motrin. So there's different reasons people do things. Uh, we sort of break them up into, you know, proactive reasons and reactive reasons. Um, 
And, and one of the interesting things about being proactive uh, is that when you're proactive, you never know what you've reduced your risk or even prevented yourself from experiencing. <laughs> so so there's, there's a, a psychological understanding of, uh, and I'll ask you, you know, what conditions or what are some of the common conditions that are a result of chronic inflammation that being proactive with this formulation specifically or others with these prime ingredients may help you reduce your risk of potentially experiencing. Uh, again, the good news would be you take the supplement, you never experience it. And for those that you know like to measure, they go, well, how do I know I wouldn't have gotten it otherwise? Um, you don't. <laughs> That's what thinking is for. Um, but help people understand who maybe just so we can connect the dots, what are some of those common experiences, whether they're conditions or, uh, you know, places of pain that are a consistent byproduct of that chronic inflammation? Yeah, well, uh, you know, one is certainly cardiac. So there was just, I just posted uh, this weekend a, a, a blog post on fish oil. And uh, fish oil was kind of moving into the place maybe five years ago where you're seeing a lot of cardiologists uh, like recommend it for their patients. And then a couple of years ago, some studies came out that said, ah, this doesn't really work so well. Um, now these huge studies are out again, even bigger than those, saying it works great for heart health. Um, so that's 200, those are two different meta-analyses, uh, more than 200,000 patients. Um, and then you get into, uh, you know, the pain stuff and, you know, the pain stuff is very specific to, uh, to you, but as an example, let's take knee osteoarthritis. So there's, there are studies on glucosamine chondroitin that show that it seems to have a cartilage protective effect if you've got more normal cartilage when you start. Um, so if you've got very severe osteoarthritis when you start, it's not going to predict protect that little remaining cartilage. But if you've got nor more normal cartilage when you start, there seems to be a protective effect of those uh, supplements. So that's a, that's a big one because we're talking about proactive chondro protection uh, would be one of those things you'd want to do. For example, I do that now annually uh, in my knee with PRP. Uh, my left knee has got a little chondromalacia patella. I'll have our guys do it at least least once a year, put some high dose PRP in that joint. Concept being not so much that, that joint really bothers me that I can't do what I want to do, but I'm trying to see if I can get as mu many miles out of it as I possibly can before that cartilage really starts to wear out. So that would be one reason as, as an example to do glucosamine chondroitin. Outstanding. Our good friend Tom is asking the question, hey Tom, uh, what about collagen supplements? Any good? That's his question. Yeah, it's interesting. I looked at collagen supplements a couple times on the uh, on the blog, primarily because there were some crazy things uh, being claimed about collagen supplements out there. There were, you know, that they were helping stem cells, that they were helping um, joints, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I've got nothing wrong or nothing against collagen supplements. They may be helpful in the same way that glucosamine and chondroitin are helpful but they're just not as well researched. And then you gotta look at how collagen supplements are, are made so that you have a good understanding of what it is we're talking about. So in order to make a collagen supplement, they, they, hydro, they, they take basically a, a, a hide from a, a cow, they throw it into a pit with lye uh, or uh, something that's, that's very, very basic to break down or hydrolyze the, the collagen. So when that's, when that's all said and done, it turns into kind of a goo because you've broken those collagen bonds. And then you basically put the goo in a pill. Uh, obviously, you dry it out, you create a powder from it. Uh, there's nothing wrong with how that's made. Uh, and that may help with things like hair growth and nails. And it, and it may help with osteoarthritis. But there just isn't the same level of research right now in collagen supplements as there is in things like glucosamine and chondroitin. More high-level research showing that those help knee osteoarthritis than we have for collagen. 
it's always an interesting balance between, uh, you know, I, I call it the theory or the expectation or the thought that this, you know, this makes sense um, and the reality of what actually does get studied. Um, and it's, uh, it's not always necessarily what gets studied the most is the most effective. It's just that's all we know and can rely on is what do we know from the studies that have been done. Um, so always a fascinating thing to just sort of think through where's the research, what makes logical sense, uh, and, and how do you put it together to come to the best conclusion? Uh, we got another great question from uh, another loyal viewer and good friend of ours. Doug Smith is asking, after stem cell PRP treatment, when can prescription statins and blood pressure be started again? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it, so when it comes to statins, I would give it a few weeks, uh, simply because we have research showing that statins can hit mesenchymal stem cell activity, so let's say a month. In addition, uh, the protective effect of statins is minuscule. Um, and I know that's hard to listen to if you take them, uh, but if you really look at the absolute uh, effects of statins, it's about a 1% reduction in absolute risk of cardiac mortality over five years. So think about that. If I told you that, um, you know, uh, I could do something to your car or I, it costs $5,000 to do, and I would reduce your risk of dying in a car crash by 1% over five years, you'd laugh at me, be like, get away from me. I'm not, <laughs> that does not, that's not enough. Uh, it's barely measurable for, for me to pay $5,000 for. And yet statins, you know, that's what we're doing. We're paying $5,000 over five years to get a 1% reduction. Now, the statin makers have convinced the FDA to allow them to report a relative risk reduction. So that means if I take it from 2% to 1%, then I can report a 50% reduction in your relative risk. Um, but uh, so the absolute risk reduction for statins is so, so minuscule that I'd stay off them for at least a month afterwards, and you're not likely to see any, any measurable difference for being off your statins for one month. Um, when it comes to blood pressure medications, I think there's bigger effects there and probably not as big effects on the cells. Uh, so a lot of that will depend on the type of blood pressure medication. So if it's an ACE inhibitor uh, type of blood pr pressure medication, a common one in that class would be lisinopril. Uh, that has a bigger effect. And so if your blood pressure is not severe, I would stay off of that for about a month. If your blood pressure is severe, then just a week or two. Um, so only you and your doctor obviously can make that decision of how long you to stay off of that medication. Uh, and then we have other types of blood pressure medications that don't really affect stem cells very much. Um, and that's everything outside of ACE inhibitors. And you can go right back on those right after the procedure. And uh, I will reiterate for uh, liability reasons, this is always a decision between you and your primary prescriber. Uh, none of this is prescriptive uh, without meeting you, seeing you, examining you, and so on. Uh, take this for entertainment purposes or whatever you'd like to. Uh, any drugs you're taking, either getting on or getting off, should be done with your primary prescriber. But now that you know that there are better questions to ask, you might want to ask those better questions. All right, let's go on to uh, a previously submitted question by Sativa Diva. Uh, does whole turmeric root work as well as curcumin. Uh, my family has been using it orally and as a paste on sore joints for generations. Yeah, so I think the big thing to do there is if you're going to use that, uh, I would make sure that you put black pepper with it. Uh, black pepper can improve, if you're gonna eat it, uh, black pepper can improve absorption in the gut. Now, as far as putting it as a paste on joints, I've got no experience with that. So if, if it seems to work, keep doing it. But as far as eating it is concerned, uh, curcumin or turmeric, uh, the curcumin that's found in the turmeric root will have a hard time getting into the gut without black pepper. So that's standard Indian cooking. Uh, lots of black pepper, lots of curcumin or, or turmeric root. Uh, so, uh, Make sure you mix those two if you're going to orally take it. Learning something new every single day. Uh, Tom responds with, uh, oh, good God. I can only imagine that's uh, 
probably related to, um, you briefly mentioned the idea of how pharma likes to manipulate science and statistics for sales. Uh, our opioid crisis is a wonderful example of how uh, you can use science as a sales technique uh, that may not necessarily be based on real valid science that uh, actually says what you are making it say. Um, I think it's been that, uh, you know, statistics never lie, statisticians do. Uh, we should all trust science, but not necessarily corrupt scientists. Uh, good God, as Tom says, w w are, are there more examples or other buyer bewares that we can and should be aware of? Because I don't think most people know how blatant that type of practice is, that, uh, that science is often cherry picked by the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, in some cases, it's fraudulent altogether. In other cases, uh, you know, the, the ones that support, I guess that's cherry picked, the, the studies and data that supports sales are, you know, brought to market and brought to the press. Uh, but conveniently, the data or studies that may not support or even disproves, uh, it's not uncommon under these proprietary confidential agreements that are now, you know, non-disclosure agreements. Um, Science isn't always science the way we understand it these days. Can you elaborate on that for all of us? Because it's such an important part of everything going on when it relates to healthcare today. I mean, yeah, I think as you brought up before, uh, Jason, we both know that uh, Marcia Engel, who was the uh, journal editor for the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, had written an editorial basically saying that, you know, she took no pleasure in saying that most of the research that was going through her journal um, couldn't really be trusted uh, with regard to uh, whether or not it was accurate. And I'll give you an anecdote on that and how that game works, because um, it works on a lot of different levels, right? One is you can massage the data to try to get what it is you want out of it. Um, and that's kind of a black box to us that don't do statistics all day. Uh, but then there's more practical things that I think you might recognize from other industries. So, uh, for example, my wife, you know, was seeing a dermatologist who said, hey, would you mind being in this study to see if we can use this filler to get rid of wrinkles in the back of your hand? She's like, well, I didn't know I had wrinkles in the back of my hand, but sure, I'll, I'll participate in your study. So uh, for whatever reason, it caused a, just an awful reaction in her, and she tried to report it. Um, and what was really fascinating was it was very clear to me in watching this whole thing of trying to report this reaction that uh, the dermatologist that was one of the study sites was pretty clear that if he reported this reaction, he would not be asked to be in another study. And these are major um, financial uh, things if you're playing this game, meaning that they pay you, let's say, $5,000 for every person you get into one of these trials. So being asked to do it again, um, a lot of times has to do with whether or not you're willing to play the game uh, on being a study site. Um, so that's another way it happens where the data tends to get massaged even before it becomes the data and gets reported to the pharma company. So yes, you've got to be very, very careful with all of this stuff. Um, and how can you be very careful for studies that aren't sponsored by the pharma companies. Uh, as examples, um, uh, the SI joint fusion device, I, uh, I blogged on this, that there was a, you know, a study sponsored by the company that made the device that showed very, very few side effects. And then you know, a year later, there's a study done by someone else that looked at an insurance company database that showed about one in five patients were having very severe side effects due to these devices and these surgeries. Um, so obviously, which one of those two am I going to trust? I'm going to trust the insurance database look because they looked for just, hey, this guy had the surgery and did he then have to go in and get other things treated that were probably related to the surgery? Um, so you got to be very, very careful to make sure you're looking for something outside uh, uh, that, that or maybe multiple studies done by multiple people. As an example, you know, we published data. On knee osteoarthritis, uh, Felipe Hernigau has published data on knee osteoarthritis. So look for several different studies that are all heading the same direction for a similar treatment. 
That's the way you do it. It's, uh, it is not easy even for experts to know what's true, what's not, what's you know, fake news, real science. Uh, it's a challenge. Uh, the one thing you, know, you have taught me and many of us time and time again is to you know, look beyond the headlines. Uh, journalists, in my opinion, are uh, extremely guilty and been culpable in this whole concept. Uh, you know, we've talked about studies that, you know, may possibly suggest X, uh, and then journalists report it as truth and fact, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you look behind, you know, some of the details a little bit more and you go, well, but that's not even close to possibly true, but there's a maybe kind of sort of effect and it just becomes truth without real truth. Uh, I don't want to stay on this yeah, too long, I mean, but it's such an important topic. A big, a big one there is university PR departments. Uh, as an example, I'm a, obviously an expert in mesenchymal stem cells for orthopedic applications. I stay on top of that literature. I read it all the time. Um, and so I've seen so many lies come out of university PR departments. You know, uh, cartilage re regeneration first. Uh, it's not even the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, or tenth time this has been reported. Then, of course, a journalist takes that without spending any time to review the literature to see if that's accurate, and obviously just you know spits it out the other side and regurgitates it onto our news feed. Um, so be very, very careful when you see things like that that are that are sourcing from university press releases. I found those university press release depart or press departments are are super duper sloppy. They, are, they will write any headline that will get clicks, even if that headline is not true. And even if that headline would have, have just, you know, the original researcher might be shocked that the university press department said that because they know that's not a true statement. Um, they know that research, they're publishing in that area. But, you know, there's that disconnect between the researcher, the press department, and then the guy that picks up the feed and writes about it. All right, tough times, but uh, that's why we do the show. You've got the power, so you have the power to be able to think and make rational decisions and at least start asking better questions, which will lead you to better outcomes. Uh, let's go to Irna, another loyal watcher and good friend. Hi, guys. For complex tear medial meniscus, which gives me some pain with movement, is the PRP or stem cells better for this kind of injury? Thanks. Yeah, so that's a, a good question uh, because it's got a, a number of different levels. You know, listen, um, as we often say, it's important to be educated, right? So the first area of education there to understand is that in if you're over 35 years of age, uh, there are, uh, and if we take a thousand people who are your age, let's say you happen to be 50, uh, who have never had a day of knee pain and won't have any knee pain likely in their lives. Uh, and we take MRIs of, of each of those thousand people's knees who again, don't have any knee pain, no knee problems. Uh, we're, about, we're likely to see half of them that'll have a meniscus tear on their MRI. So what does that tell us? It tells us that meniscus tears generally aren't a source of pain. In fact, uh, other researchers have written articles with titles like uh, meniscus tears are as important as wrinkles. Um, meaning that we all know as we age, we're going to get wrinkles. There's no you know, escaping it. Um, in the same way as we age, we're going to get meniscus tears. Some of us will. So the first question to ask, which is absolutely critical, is, is that meniscus tear causing the pain? Um, is it the cause of why your knee hurts? And then if you can get over that hurdle and you we're trying to treat that meniscus tear, then yes, we've used both PRP and bone marrow uh, concentrate or same day bone marrow stem cells. Of the two, the stem cells pack a bigger punch, but it may be that really that knee meniscus tear has very little with why your knee hurts and a much less expensive PRP injection may help that uh, knee pain uh, uh, because you only have mild arthritis for a long period of time and also help protect that cartilage. So. Is it the knee meniscus? And then what are the kind of things that can help a knee meniscus? And that's both PRP and, and bone marrow concentrate. That, uh, that same concept has come up for spinal discs, uh, that there's 
uh, kind of coincidence and co actual causation. Um, and they're often misunderstood between the two. So great question. Thank you for asking. Uh, Doug Smith followed up his uh, feedback with absolutely thanks. And uh, you're welcome, Doug. Thanks for watching. Tom's got a follow-up question. He asks, uh, is there any benefit to consuming bone broth for overall musculoskeletal health? Yeah, I know bone broth has been a big one. Um, you know, the answer is we really don't know. Um, so uh, again, you know, being a researcher, I tend to put things into, do we have, you know, really good clinical research? Do we have pretty good clinical research? Do we have some clinical research? Do we have no clinical research? And bone broth is way over here. Uh, we really don't have much clinical research on it. So the answer is, I, I don't know. Uh, we don't have much clinical research showing that bone broth will, uh, will help you. Um, so uh, until we do, I would say uh, if you take it and it works, keep taking it because uh, it's unlikely to hurt you. Um, and if you take it and you're not sure, then probably wait till the research comes out. All right. There you go. We got more questions coming. We've got Rachel who's following up asking, have you guys considered offering in-house imaging such as X-ray and DMX? Yeah, we, we've considered it. Um, we certainly have the ability to take some x-rays if we need to. Obviously, uh, in our clinic in Colorado, we've got three uh, x-ray machines in that clinic. Um, so we've certainly got the ability to do that. On the DMX side, we've, we've talked about it. We've thought about it. Uh, the biggest uh, concern there is just it's a, an area of expertise in and of itself uh, to get good at talking and walking a patient through that process to get a really good image. So we've uh, left it outsourced, at least locally where we are, to a, a clinic that's expert in getting those, those images because the quality of those images really do factor in to whether or not we get anything meaningful out of that, uh, that uh, imaging series. Such an important point to make there. Uh, as we've said time and time again, one of the differences between going to Centeno Schultz or a Regenix affiliate uh, is the amount of time a doctor will spend with you to listen and learn about your history, your personal health history, uh, the history of your injury, uh, and really learn from you what is the actual cause. Imaging is one part of that sort of Sherlock Holmes mystery. And I, I bring that up because it's, a, it's such an important, essential part of getting great outcomes is making sure that the recommendations for your care are based on accurate diagnoses. And that comes from making sure that things like your imaging and the amount of time your doctor spends with you uh, leads to a proper diagnosis. Uh, care to comment on that at all, or shall we move on to next questions, Don? Yeah, so a good example of that is uh, flexion extension x-rays in the low back. Um, we, uh, we only work with a couple places that will let do them because they need to be done in a certain way in order to make sure you get enough movement. Um, and frequently we'll see them coming back with, uh, without uh, enough movement. So long story short is, yeah, making sure the imaging done, is done right is, is pretty critical uh, for the person looking at the imaging, obviously, because they've got to make sure they've got the right information to interpret. I would uh, probably add to that is uh, taking it as one thing, writing the report, interpreting it as a second part. And these facilities have, you know, expert radiologists uh, to, to provide the uh, summary of what is actually on uh, the images as well. Sounds yes. right? Uh, right on. Yeah. And, and you also have to realize, too, that, you know, one of the things that you really need to expect from the doctor that you see is the doctor that you see will review the images with you, show you what's on those images. Um, I would not allow the doctor to just read uh, the radiology report. So always make sure you bring your images or you've sent those images in because that's a critical part of not only uh, looking for things, meaning making sure your doctor knows what he's looking at on those uh, images, but also uh, for you to understand what they show. Um, and you may not get all of it, but you'll be able to get a good sense of, well, look at this right here. See how this doesn't do that. And this pooch is out there and it's not supposed to, you know, it's all of that as part of getting educated as a patient, uh, to make sure that you know what's wrong with you and what the plan is to try to do something about it. Cause I can't tell you 
the number of patients I've talked to where I've asked these questions, what's wrong? And they really don't know. Why don't they know? Because no one's really sat them down to try to explain it to them. So that's such a critical part. Reviewing images is such a critical part of understanding what's wrong with you. Yeah. And, and to add to that, the idea of uh, sometimes they'll explain it, but it'll be so scientific and so complex, it's impossible to even remember or even make sense of it all. Uh, so be your own best advocate. Uh, if somebody's explaining something to you and you just don't understand it, uh, ask them to explain it in really simple terms. Uh, and in many cases, they will. Doctors in many cases have been trained to sound like doctors. <laughs> and so they use really expensive words like arthritis when it just translates to inflammation in the joint, which is what you told the doctor. Um, so be an advocate and, and really do your best to try to understand what exactly is going on. Uh, we love to translate in, you know, Greek and Latin and other impressive ways to sort of confuse you as to what exactly is going on. That's not unintentional as the history of medicine has uh, unfolded over the decades. But the important part is that you actually know what is going on so you can make the right choice. And you don't just go, I don't know, the doctor said it was some kind of thing uh, and I'll just trust him. Th that's part of the plan. Uh, so be your own advocate and make sure that you take your power back and go, if I was in fifth grade, how would you explain this to me? And see if they can do it that way. Also, you know, another key thing is if you've had a lot of procedures, keep a procedure list um, and and know what they are. Uh, keep an imaging list. These are the these are the imaging things I've had. These are the procedures I've had, and whether or not they worked, uh, or what they did, or if you had any complications, what those were. Those are all extremely important things to me as a doctor when seeing a complex patient. Um, it's it gets very 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 difficult and takes a lot of time when you say, okay, uh, you had an injection to your neck. Uh, where was that injection? It was in my neck. No, no, which, which, which area in the neck? Was it an epidural? Was it a facet injection? Was it radiofrequency ablation? Oh, I don't know any of that. So really critical to, to know what that stuff is, learn what that stuff is, write it down, uh, because it makes the process of understanding what's wrong with you as a new patient so much quicker, and it's much less likely that stuff will get missed. Be engaged, understand what's happening, understand what you're being told, and have a good sense of sort of what your story is over time. Uh, not just the symptoms, but what procedures you've had, what impact they've had. It'll make it easier for any future doctor, especially if you go to a Regenex or Centeno Schultz clinic, uh, which is a great question coming up from our friend Doug, who asks the question, is the equipment used to create PRP and stem cells at the Centeno Schultz clinic the same as all the other Regenex facilities? Great question. Yeah, it is. Just realize uh, that the major difference for Centeno Schultz is that um, since we're kind of the HQ site, we've got a much, much bigger lab. So the average uh, Regenex affiliate has a smaller lab. Uh, they use the same equipment that we do at Centeno Schultz. Uh, we just have more of it in a bigger facility than uh, than the average Regenix affiliate. So that's the major difference there. And the other difference is we're the research site. So we end up doing, um, you know, primary lab research in a separate facility that's on site, meaning we have a separate research lab within a processing lab. And then sometimes uh, when we find things over here, those get tried out in the processing lab uh, so that we can start to implement those in patients. So those are the major differences between that, but it's the same protocols, it's the same stuff, it's just more the scale is different at Centeno Schultz. There we go, and it is a very impressive lab. Uh, I'm proud to say I've been there, I've seen it, it's, uh, it's amazing what you have there. Uh, and it's amazing how we are learning about the ability for the body to heal itself and really enhance the body's natural recuperative powers uh, versus what I think of as to some degree as insult the body's inherent recuperative powers, which really are what drugs and surgeries do. Uh, not to say that there's not a time and place for those things, but the, the real difference between, and again, this is the challenge for most consumers, you know, it's like, well, should I do a, a steroid injection or a PRP injection as if they're anything close to the same? 
Besides the word injection, they couldn't be more different. Um, so maybe as we sort of close up in our last few minutes, let's help people understand what they should be looking for. What is the difference between sort of a therapeutic that's specifically and almost exclusively designed to accomplish one specific outcome, such as pain relief temporarily, which you could argue a steroid may do in some cases, uh, versus uh, what using either your body's blood or stem cells you created for yourself, for your own natural healing, and the healing repair process, which is different than we got rid of the symptom temporarily for a period of time at a expensive cost, and I'm not talking financially. Yeah, so so corticosteroids are um, high dose anti-inflammatories, so they're very good at, at suppressing inflammation, but they're also good at uh, suppressing the immune and repair response in a given area. Uh, PRP being very different, PRP is more regenerative. So the concept is you're trying to fix something or prompt some repair. Now, I think it, it's important for everyone to understand that, that even just using that one word, because Jason was just talking about using these different words, uh, PRP, PRP in some clinics is completely different than, than others. So we all call it PRP, but let's say some PRP is red because it's got red blood cells in it, white blood cells. And there are a few instances where you'd want to use that. But for the most part, you'd want your PRP to be amber, which has uh, no or a few red blood cells or a few white blood cells. Um, and then you've got concentration differences. Uh, is the PRP low dose? Is it medium dose? Is it high dose? Uh, and those are can be used differently in different people. For instance, lower doses work just fine in young people. But as you get into middle age and older age, you're going to want much, much higher doses. Um, and generally, much higher doses than most clinic uh, bedside machines can produce. So that's just a short primer on, on the differences of PRP uh, and how radical that can be. All of those clinics call it PRP, the same thing. But we've got four different products we talked about within that category that act completely differently um, in the patient. And, and there'd be different reasons to use different ones uh, in a patient. And yet some clinics can only produce one of those. And that's all they've got. Uh, it's a one size fits all. So very important to understand that when we use those terms, we can be talking about lots of different things with the same term. It's a, it's a very big challenge. I know we suffer that within chiropractic. Uh, you know, there's a whole spectrum. You say the word chiropractor, uh, and most people reference their experience or lack thereof. Uh, and yet, as a professional, I can tell you there's an entire spectrum of specialties uh, within chiropractic, different techniques, different uh, educational specialists, and so on. Um, so it, it is important to participate and not just hear the word and, ex and expect it to be sort of a commodity anywhere you get it. Uh, it has everything to do with who the expert or technician is, what their training is, as I asked before, what tools they use or technology they have access to. Uh, those are all parts of the equation here. And as we started off even with supplements, uh, vitamin C from a big box store may not be the same or isn't the same as vitamin C from a professional grade supplement company. So there is work to do. Uh, it is important if you want best outcomes uh, and to be as healthy as you possibly can to make the investment to learn these things. And nobody's saying it's that easy because it's not, even as doctors uh, the more you know, the less you know, uh, because the more you realize how much there is to learn uh, about these different topics. But keep doing your best to ask the right questions. Make sure you are working with people you can trust, that you can have access to asking those questions. Uh, and like you see here, have sort of a regular group of people. We think of it as our proactive membership, our family uh, of people that know that they're not just looking for the cheapest, closest option. They're looking for the best care they can find and afford. And that's what you get here when you work with Centeno Schultz and the Regenex Network. Uh, one of our final questions we have uh, was submitted earlier. It says, Amy Newsom has a question about SI joint dysfunction, hypermobility, 
that's all I got here. So whatever you can uh, sort of explain about SI joint dysfunction and hypermobility would be appreciated. Yeah, so the SI joint uh, is the joint between your tailbone and the back of the hip. Uh, and it's really what's called the viscoelastic joint. So what that means is it, it gives and it transfers force. So it doesn't move like an elbow, elbow joint moves. Um, it actually just absorbs force. Now, uh, to do that, it's got very, very strong ligaments and two cartilage surfaces up against each other. So it kind of gives uh, as you walk, for example, or run, force comes up the leg, goes through your hip, goes into the SI joint, up to the spine. Uh, now, when those ligaments get damaged, it can become unstable, and it can become a bad shock absorber, um, and that can lead to pain. Um, now, the, the most reliable way we've seen to treat that through the years, the good news is there's lots of different options. Uh, simple prolotherapy will help tighten those ligaments. PRP works well. Bone marrow concentrate uh, or same-day stem cell uh, bone marrow procedure works well. Um, more recently, we've seen SI joint fusions being offered, uh, and that's really interesting because back in the 80s started practice, SI joint fusions were all the rage until surgeons kind of abandoned them because they were seeing such bad side effects due to them, meaning that if you fuse the SI joint, you've got the hip down here, which can then start going bad because you're putting more motion there, or you've got the uh, L5-S1 segment in the spine, which can start to go bad because you're pushing more, more force there. Um, and, and then about five, 10 years ago, we saw these uh, minimally invasive SI joint fusions uh, become more popular. And now uh, these are being pushed. There's five or six different products on the market where you can bang some sort of dowel through the SI joint to fuse it. Um, and that's a bad idea. Now, it's not to say that there isn't maybe one in 100 people who have SI joint dysfunction that doesn't respond to physical therapy and won't respond to orthobiologics that might need that. So it's probably good to have as an option. But instead of being used like that, it's being used in the 99 out of 100 that would respond to orthobiologic injections. Um, and it's a one-way street operation. You get that operation, there's no going back. There's no way to unfuse your SI joint. It is what it is. And you buy all the, the future complications and issues with that for the rest of your life. So the biggest thing I can say to people with SI joint instability is stay away from an SI joint fusion. Try all this orthobiologic stuff first because, you know, just looking at the odds, you're probably in that 99 out of 100 that are going to do very well with orthobiologic injections and end up with a joint that functions like it should versus a joint that is fused together. Buyer beware. Uh, do not underestimate the power of all of those pharmaceutical ads you see every day, all day, sponsoring just about everything you watch, read, and listen to. Uh, it is not by accident. It is on purpose, and it is to drive you to believe that these expensive, invasive drugs and surgeries are the best outcome you can expect and the first place to go. Uh, unfortunately, with a lot of the medical information that's being reported today, journalists are not being, as far as I'm concerned, responsible to share the whole story of the many, 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 many things you likely could be doing first yourself, second with more conservative providers that in most cases do not prescribe drugs or surgery, and then in as a last resort after you've exhausted the inexpensive, less invasive self-care and easy options, then you resort to the big big stuff, the big guns that are irreversible. And often, ironically, like medications, one of the common complaints about going to a chiropractor is, well, once you start, you got to keep on going. Well, you don't have to keep on going, but they don't usually say that about the medications that are prescribed. You know, Once you start, when do you think you're getting off of those? So we just have been convinced, persuaded, maybe I'll dare say brainwashed, that there is a pill, potion, and surgery to fix all of us quickly and easily, and don't worry, your insurance will cover it. It is a problem. It is what is leading towards our healthcare crisis that is affecting and infecting many of us, and that is our buyer beware. That is our message for You've Got the Power. 
Uh, that's the top of the hour. So that means it's time for us to uh, split for today. We will back on Friday. We'll be broadcasting live from the Regenex Facebook page. We'll alternate back and forth. We love and appreciate your comments. We thank you for engaging. We appreciate when you share this program with other people that you know should be here learning how to take the power back for their health and health care decisions themselves. On behalf of Dr. Chris Centeno, I'm Dr. Jason Deitch. Thank you for watching another episode of You've Got the Power. We'll see you Friday on the Regenix Facebook page. Until then, stay well and be kind. Thank you for watching.